So uh, while they're fixing the tech, how, how many people here have ever failed? Okay. And in, in terms of professionally in, in civic tech, would you say something you worked on just didn't work and you had to shut it down? Okay, great. Well, that's great. Glad we're all in. Hi, it's like a, a big AA meeting. Hi, my name is... It wasn't my problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I just want to say, first of all, um, I'm glad to see that. This is meant to be a learning space. Uh, clearly, we need to learn and can learn. In fact, perhaps the only way we learn is by making mistakes. As Thomas Edison said, you know, he didn't fail. He just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. Um, and okay, slide. Let's see. It's not going. I'm pressing the wrong button. Let me use this. Did that work? Okay. Hmm? Now I've made the screen go off. I've already failed. <laughs> uh, that, no. So, yeah, you need to see it here. Um. The entire screen has gone blank. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <let> me done. <laughs> Yes. Tell me what button you want me to press. And then that, that should just be scrollable. Yes, cool. it is. Good. Go. Okay, scrollable. What did he do? Oh, come back, sir. You're going to have to do this for me. Which button? So I was just going up and down on this. When he presses it, it works. Okay. <laughs> So, and as Esther Dyson likes to say, you always have to make new mistakes. So, um, I'm literally going to scroll through these really fast. Also, I just want to say that the civic tech field is full of successes, okay? We're not going to spend any time talking about them in this session, but I want to acknowledge that, um, that this is not about uh, uh, dragging anybody or, or obsessing with uh, the failures. It's just to be honest. Uh, we've been around long enough, let's try and learn from some patterns and some clusters of types of failure. Um, I literally have to scroll down through everything to get this to, geez, okay. So failure is not unusual. In fact, in the whole startup field, something like 75% of VC-funded startups in the United States uh, fail. Uh, these are things getting more than a million dollars in, in early stage funding, uh, according to a Harvard study. Um, and the, the most common reasons uh, gleaned from lots of failure post-mortems um, will sound pretty familiar to you. And this is just for tech startups, not just for civic tech. Uh, the biggest reason, not finding a market need, uh, running out of money, not having the right talent, um, getting out-competed, uh, not getting the pricing correct, um, or building a product that people don't really want to use. So. To get into uh, the specific patterns of civic tech failure that we found from looking at the civic tech field guide, so we've got about close to 2,000 instances in the field guide of, of, of which about half are actual products or entities or platforms or tools. Um, and what we zeroed in on uh, out of those 1,000 were um, things that we knew were dead um, and that also had some early stage support. So this is not a discussion about uh, projects that people started on a weekend and then abandoned, okay? Those don't count. We, we live in a space where it's so easy for people to start things um, and try and see if you get any traction uh, that it would be a mistake to sort of focus just on those failures. We wanted to look at things that actually had um, some capital behind them, teams, a presence, users, and yet they've still failed. Um, the first, obviously, the biggest reason uh, over and over again is just the failure to, um, you know, design really with users in mind. Um, if you build it, they don't come most of the time, and this is why the Lean Startup methodology uh, is so useful uh, to do constant user research and to be paying attention to what users actually want. A second reason, uh, which often uh, isn't talked about enough, um, and we saw this especially in cases of civic tech organizations like Sunlight, for example, where I was an advisor for 10 years, or My Society, uh, where you have multiple projects and you actually are trying lots of things, uh, but at a certain point, uh, you decide to prune. And you realize you cannot support everything. You should put your, 
your resources uh, on the things that are either uh, proving to have the most value or where you actually also think uniquely you play a role in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, there's a good example of a, a project that uh, uh, my society shut down called Pledge Bank, which was actually a thriving project um, uh, helping people aggregate collective action. But by the point at which they shut it down, uh, to their own explanation, uh, it's partly because there were other places where you could do that as well. There was no special reason that my society needed to keep this thing going. Um, and then the last reason that we often see things shut down, and again, this isn't talked about enough, is that founders uh, often get acquired. Teams get acquired. Um, a good example of this was when Change.org bought uh, Electnext, uh, which was a uh, opinion matching site for people trying to decide who to vote for. Um, uh, Change.org didn't continue that product. What they wanted was Kia Dannenbaum, who was a great product manager, as part of their team. Um, and, and this is a, a perfectly reasonable ending, uh, I think, especially when you consider how hard it is uh, to do all the things that founders do and that sometimes it's better to go inside a larger company where someone else is worrying about problems like meeting payroll and, and you're just getting to do the thing you, that you love to do best. Um, so we often see that happen. So uh, now to sort of drill down a little bit further, um, out of the 44 entities, and I, I should say, you can look on the Civic Tech Field Guide yourself. It's bit.ly slash organized civic tech. We've opened a new tab uh, that we call the Graveyard, um, and uh, that's a provisional name. If, if, it, if people have a better one, let me know. Uh, and again, this is a first pass. This is mostly American-focused data, uh, and one of the things that Matt and I are working on, and in fact, inviting people to a meeting uh, Friday morning uh, is to help us figure out how to get more contributions into the guide for more uh, international uh, settings than uh, primarily just the Anglo-speaking internet. Um, but of the 44 that we, we were able to do some deeper research into the, what these sites were and, and why, uh, as best we can tell, they failed, uh, there were some clear clusters. Um, great, I have to really scroll down. So the first one is um, efforts to uh, solve collective action problems. And there's a recurring pattern here. Uh, sites that try and get people, uh, and you think uh, in the abstract, this is, a, this is a really good idea. Let's make it easy for people to get together uh, to take some common action. The biggest failure in this sector uh, is a site called The Point. How many people here know what The Point was? Um, one, good. How many of you know what Groupon is? So Groupon is what grew out of the point. Uh, when Andrew Mason started the point, he actually raised seven and a half million dollars in early venture funding for this. And um, the, uh, it called itself a tipping point based collective action website dedicated to getting people together to accomplish a goal. Um, the problem they had is that the barrier to action was really high. So for example, they were trying to get people to pledge to be part of a campaign to get Aquafina to switch to biodegradable bottles. And they needed 50,000 people to sign up for that before that action would be triggered. They wanted to get um, uh, Universal Music to sell DRM-free songs. They needed a million participants for that action to be. So clearly, they set the, the, the trigger level way too high. And they were also asking people to do something that didn't sort of flow easily uh, out of the normal course of, of what humans do. Um, and actually, Andrew Mason has said that the idea for Groupon came to him when he noticed that users on the point, there was a group who were actually building uh, a campaign together to save money by buying things together, right? And it turns out that uh, personally saving money is a pretty strong uh, motivation. Self-interest works really well there. Uh, and that's when he pivoted to Groupon, and the rest is history. Um, but this, we've seen the pattern again and again, and I think there's a lesson here for why these kinds of efforts fail. The first one is that uh, the collective action dilemma is real. It really is not uh, uh, common sense to think that your small action uh, will make a difference. And even when you try and show people that, you know, if we all do it together, it will make a difference, they, they, by then they've already gone to another website. Um, so asking people to do something really out of their ordinary um, is a pretty high barrier to action. There are other reasons we think these kinds of sites fail. One is 
um, that we think that there are uh, easier entry points for collective action. There's a reason why signing a petition gathers lots of people. It is not a high barrier to entry. And frequently, the most interesting thing for me is to watch people enter at a low level and then move to a higher level. So um, whether it's on petition sites like change.org, which is a very successful example, uh, or just people doing it on their own through hashtag campaigns followed by you know, put money in my GoFundMe account. You see people d solving the collective action problem just using simple consumer available level tools rather than saying, oh, I, I gotta go to that website that somebody built special for this. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. Uh, second set of clusters, and this is the one that uh, I see most often. People come and pitch us and I'm like, please don't do this. Um, but yet again, it, it comes up again and again, people trying to build uh, the one-stop shopping solution for all your political needs, right? Um, and there's a long history of these, and uh, you know some of them with quite uh, you know notable levels of of usage. For example, Voter.com. What a great URL, right? Uh, in 2000, they they got 17 million unique visits around Election Day, and yet within a year they closed down. Um, Vote IQ, which launched about 10 years later. I remember when they came to PDF to launch, they were so excited and I felt so bad for them um, because even though they had $2 million in venture funding, I, all my instincts said that this too was going to fail and sure enough it did. Um, and there, I think there's a subtle lesson inside of that story, uh, which is um, just because you can raise $2 million from a VC uh, doesn't mean that either you or the VC is smart. Um, there's a lot of very gullible uh, uh, money sloshing around out there and uh, lots of people who actually don't do this research and uh, get excited. I just noticed the other day that Ballot Ready, they just raised 1.5 million. Um, again, another site to give you all the information you could ever want about everybody who's gonna be on ballot. Uh, how many people here think that's gonna fail too? Raise your hand. Come on, you gotta show some more courage. I mean, clearly that, you know, if you can get that same information now from Facebook, why would you go to another website to do it? Um, so uh, lessons in the failures of these kinds of products. The first one is that uh, politics is actually uh, complicated and most people don't really want to know the details. Um, that they, just give me the headlines, right? So this assumption that there's a big demand for a lot of detailed information um, is a false assumption, uh, certainly in the American context. Uh, the second thing is uh, the idea that a generic nonpartisan hub for this information is the way to provide it uh, cuts up against the grain of the fact that most of us who are interested in politics do so for partisan reasons. We've, we've got a, a team that we root for or a tribe that we believe in, um, and so the generic nonpartisan hub, however good and civic that may sound, uh, just doesn't seem to click with your intense political uh, users online. Um, then there's the idea that, well, maybe we can make this information valuable to elected representatives. Um, actually really interesting to hear about Facebook's experiment in, in this uh, genre with the sort of constituent badging. Um, but so far we have not seen uh, certainly monetizable interest from representatives uh, to, who want to pay for this information. They will pay to uh, advertise to those people, I guess. Uh, so think about that. Um, the incumbent hubs that provide this information are already doing a good enough job. That's yet another reason why you should uh, have second thoughts. The fact that, for example, Open Congress, which we supported at Sunlight for a long time, which was better at SEO and had more group forming tools and had a bunch of other nifty features and yet it never displaced govtrack.us and in fact now if you go to opencongress.org it redirects you to govtrack and govtrack is built and run essentially by one person who's been doing it for about 13 years. God bless them. Um, you know, and let's face it, uh, sometimes it's like the incumbent wins because they're good enough. Um, Last example, I think I have time for, maybe won't get to the fourth one. Why don't opinion matching sites click with people again? Uh, th these are sites, by the way, that do things like uh, help me decide who to vote for, right? So again, to the previous points, politics is, is complicated, not that many people are that 
in, in need of the answer to the question, who should I vote for? Uh, they get the answer through other means as opposed to the rational ones of let me do the opinion matching thing. Um, and to paraphrase the way people inside Google uh, are said to think about this, it's not a toothbrush problem. It's not something you need to do twice a day. Um, and so uh, it, the fact that you do want to know the answer to the question, who should I vote for, but it only happens for about two weeks out of every four years, means that that's not enough of a consistent user base for you to sustain your, your project. Uh, the last failure in this genre was vote, vote is in, which had a really interesting idea that we should make our voting preferences social. So, uh, and, and for some of us, this is actually a useful thing. I, I used to joke that I controlled at least 10 votes uh, in New York based on the number of people who would ask me before an election who they should vote for. So why don't I make that sort of information more socially shareable? Uh, they started in San Francisco, a place where people love to share everything, and yet they could not get uh, enough traction to keep voters in going. Um, and they had certainly plenty of money uh, as well. Okay, I do have time for this last example. Uh, hyperlocal, why don't hyperlocal sites that are trying to, you know, basically take everything from local blogs and, and local open data. Uh, about 10 years ago, we had two very prominent, well-funded startups in this space, Outside In, started by Steven Johnson, uh, who raised, I think, about $14 million in all for this project before he sold it to AOL. Uh, Every Block, funded with a Night News Challenge grant of about $1.1 million, uh, ultimately sold to MSNBC. Uh, why, why does hyperlocal keep failing uh, in the civic space? And um, I think maybe we should be humble and say that no one can figure it out. Uh, AOL with Patch hasn't figured it out. So, you know, places with lots of capital uh, that local uh, uh, news and information of some quality there just doesn't have a, a market answer. That's one possible answer. Uh, there are others. It may be that Every Block and uh, Outside In were uh, too soon. Uh, both of them launched pre, you know, in the era where uh, people in the United States were just really starting to use smartphones. Not everybody had a cheap data plan. Uh, so it might be that the conditions for the, this market are better. I would say the fact that both Google and Facebook have now recently uh, begun to prioritize local news more in newsfeed and in search results may actually improve the chances for people doing hyperlocal news. We don't know. Uh, but we should also recognize the external conditions at work uh, that both Twitter and Facebook have provide so much local information to people already that they may, in effect, be soaking up all the oxygen available to support these kinds of efforts. Um, so uh, external conditions matter too. So. Um, this type of inquiry is one of the reasons why uh, Matt and I are working on upgrading uh, the Civic Tech Field Guide. Um, we know that uh, the information that you know, we've just given you here is just preliminary. I'm sure you probably could add a lot more examples of uh, failed efforts. Please put them into the guide for us. It's open source, um, and uh, you know, we benefit from the contributions of everyone. The URL, again, is bit.ly.com slash organized civic tech. And I should just say, for both of the talks that uh, we've done, this one and the previous one, um, we're going to be turning these into articles on Civicist uh, and posting our slides. So uh, looking forward to engaging with you further there. Thank you.